Gloria Avner, and I have been teaching a teak technique in painting for a little over 15 years. I started thinking about how many people I've taught over the years, and when I got close to 500, I stopped. I'm grateful for all my students, I'm grateful for all I've learned doing it, and I'm going to try in 45 minutes to demonstrate as much as I can to you to see, to have you see, how much you'd like to add this to your repertoire of watercolor skills. Batik as it was practiced thousands of years ago is not of great interest to me because I don't like working with fabric. It's cumbersome. So what I'm going to be demonstrating to you is ancient techniques made new using rice paper. I don't know if you can see, but there's a thread that runs through this rice paper. You may have rice paper that you enjoy. I have one brand that I like. It's Ken Washi. I get it from Daniel Smith. And if you can't see the threads, Trust me, there's a shiny side and there's a thready side. And it's easier to paint on the shiny, smooth side. So that's the side we want to have up. There are a lot of moving parts to this. But if you take it one step at a time, I think you'll find that this will revitalize your watercolor practice. You already know how to use watercolors. You know what brushes you like. You know what your favorite colors are. But with this batik technique, which involves using wax as a resist, you layer colors and get effects that you could not get in any other way. So let's start at the beginning. What actually do you need to do this antique style of painting. We're going to be using watercolors, ink, and we're going to be doing it on the paper that I showed you. But I have found that you really need to have a good, smooth work surface. So the first thing I do is take a piece of ordinary cardboard, pull off some ordinary freezer paper, which is shiny on one side, and tape it to the back. This is your desk, your own private desk, and you will be using it throughout the painting. You take it with you, with your paper. Now, why am I saying take it with you? There is some moving around in this. It's almost like exercise. Exercise for the mind, the imagination, and the feet, because there are stations. Let me finish what we're going to need before I tell you, start to tell you, the steps. So you have your work surface, you have your paper, you need your subject matter. I'm sure that you have hundreds of photographs, as I do, or things that have inspired you from a calendar or a friend's photographs. Pick what you like. I have a folder. When people come to my class, I spread out 75 pictures. They can pick whatever they like. It's always with a foreground where the background isn't so important, but you need a central figure or figures, whether it's animals, birds, flowers, houses, trees, it doesn't matter. But what really doesn't matter, or matters, is that you don't want a complicated background because that's what's going to make your painting spectacular. Once you have decided on your subject matter, you attach it to your board. Today we're going to work on a flamingo painting. I try to pick subject matter that 
is very successful every time. And sometimes the simplest is the best. Today we're going with kind of medium. It's not complicated. It's not overly simple. It will give you a little idea of the steps, the parts and the pieces that you will use in rhythm when you're doing your painting. So the first thing you need to do, aha, more supplies. We need masking tape. The first thing you need to do is take a piece of tape, sound effects, rip it, unless you're somebody who has to do things with scissors, and attach it. Is there anybody watching who ha I'm testing for the shiny side, the smooth side? Uh, you have to make a lot of decisions when you're doing this. Do I want to have more room up above, more room on the bottom, more room on the sides? That's decision number one. I'd like to have a little more sky and a little more water. And you put another piece of tape. You do not have to tape the whole thing down. You're just doing this so it doesn't move around a lot. Next decision. You will have a thin Sharpie and a thick Sharpie. And there are more expensive permanent pens that even have better um, clearer lines. One thing about working on rice paper is it does bleed, which makes for some interesting challenges and also for some surprises, which are not a bad thing, which brings me to another piece of material that's very necessary for this. And it is called a paper towel, you say? No, no, no. It looks like a paper towel, it acts like a paper towel. What it really is, is an insurance policy. When you are painting, if you have a bleeding problem, you immediately press down on the paper where it's bleeding and it will suck it up. We like that. The other thing that you will have near you is a piece of the same paper uh, by the way, I love to, you can cut this with scissors very easily, but I like to tear it. You get a really nice deckled edge. This is just a piece of scrap paper, but again, it's going to be important in making decisions. So, do I like the skinny Sharpie? Ooh, that's too skinny for me. Maybe this one's better. Ah, yes. Or, would I like the fat one? I might like that. So those are your choices here. You'll be using paper also for colors. Because you can't really tell when you're mixing the color what it's going to be like when it's on the paper. So, you're ready now. Now, there are some people who have a little bit of prejudice against tracing. Tracing has been used by all the great masters, whether they're projecting something on a wall. Don't feel bad about it, especially if it's your material. It's a way to get the composition that you want. So, I don't know if you can see. You can see fairly well. But if you can't, you go to your window or a door and tape it right on the door or window, and it's like having your own light box. So, I decided to save us a step or two. You all know how to do this once you've made your decision. So, I've gone to the point where I've done mine. I've done it mostly with a thicker Sharpie. So I don't need the tape anymore. I'm going to take off the tape because it's a mess if you don't. And I hate to see grown people cry 
if at the end the tape is still on there and the paper is wet and it rips. So we're done with the tape now and we're ready to go with the next phase. And the last thing I tell people when they've finished getting their design onto the paper is, okay, don't start painting yet. You need to write your artist's signature, your beautiful artist's signature, preferably with the thin Sharpie. It's not ego. It's to make sure you know what side you're putting the wax on, which will be very important later. Okay, so now you start painting. Oops, there's steps in this too. The first thing you do when you're painting is tell yourself, ask yourself, where do I want white? Why am I asking that? Because you cannot paint white. You get white by painting wax. I'm going to show you the wax station in a little bit. After we paint, no, no, we're going to do the wax first. Here are the three major steps to the technique. Over and over and over in every painting you will do. Wax, and in parentheses, what wax really means, except for when you paint the white, wax means save. You're saving the white. You can't get white with paint. Not with watercolor, in my experience. Good. So you save the white. Then you paint. And you don't paint fussily. You don't take your brush and go like that. On this paper, with watercolor, it pretty much paints itself. So we're going to do that in a minute. So you are examining your painting. Let's look at the original painting. It's not a great painting, but it's a nice painting. It's fun. And this is where the white was on this. So what I have people do is take your color picture with you. Take your color picture. Always take your board. And we're going to go now. We're going to go to the wax station. Okay. Now we're ready for that first step, for saving the whites. I have my picture up here where I can refer to it. I might not want to do it exactly the way I did it before or a student did it before, but it gives me a guideline. And when you have your photograph, you'll have a good guideline. And of course, you have the option of doing something else. So I'm going to use two different brushes. The wax, by the way, is Gulf Wax. You can get it at Publix. It comes in a tablet form, you put it in. I try to keep my, this is, this was once my favorite fryer. It is no longer. Um, but you can get small ones, or you can use a cake tin in a fry pan that has water in it. So you've created a little double boiler. You can put a tuna fish can in and have a, a clip, um, like for hanging up clothes, and take it out for when you're ready. I like having a big pot of wax, and of course when I have students, I try to have no more than two students per pot of wax, because now we're doing our best to make sure they're social distancing. My goal is to be able to break this down into enough segments so people can do it at home, online, but the best is doing it with me. Okay, so I'm going to start. We know we want that to be all white, so I don't want a big blob on my paper. That has happened. We can correct anything. That's what a teacher is for. So I give it a little shake, but I have to do it fast because it cools quickly. Okay, 
So I've just done the beak, the part of the beak that's white. One thing to remember, and all the things I'm telling you to remember, are mistakes that I have made many times. When you wax something, you immediately pull the paper up so that it doesn't stick, so you don't have to even think about their big rips. Okay, well I'm going to do that next. Meanwhile, you're thinking about light. Where is the light hitting these burrs? Where would I want white to have as background? So here I go again, quickly. I did a little too much on the top of his head, but that's okay. I'm going to do a little on his neck. And the legs are kind of light. I don't want to cover them all, so I'm just doing little bitty stripes. You can also use the side of the brush. So I like, I like this kind of wide stripe here. So I'm using my brush to do that. I'm making sure it's hot. And then I just want some little... And what am I doing next? I'm lifting it off so it doesn't stick. Then I want to do the same thing. Ah, oh, see it's getting a little hot. When it's bubbly, turn it back down to warm. So I'm going to do a little more here. I think he needs some on his neck because the light is shining. And let's get the other legs done. Just little bits. So no paint will take where there's wax. That is the beauty. And I like doing a little bit showing the movement of the water. Because after all, water is movement, especially when you're standing in it and going for fish. Let's do some, let's do a little bit more. I think he's fine. I don't know, remember if we did his legs. Let's pick it up again. And I think we need some on the leaves. I, I noticed there wasn't much on that, but I'm just going to do a few little dibs, dabs, almost random. We love making random dots, dashes, splashes. It just adds texture to the end when you're doing your background. So what I like to do is get this wet and then I have to do this looking at it. And then with a big energetic diagonal I go, there wasn't any. You don't want to do this near another person when they're painting because they might not like to have your little splashes. Okay. When you do that, you get some interesting diagonal dots. You can't see them, but you will later. Anything there? One more time. Okay. So, now that you have now that you have your whites, and those are going to be the only places you have whites, I think I will put a little more white in the water at this point. Just, again, just kind of random. You know that water is always horizontal. I'm having a little too much fun. No, there's no such thing as too much fun. Okay. Now, one of the things that's interesting about not being able to use white is that you can't make pink by mixing red with white. So I've taken some cadmium medium. I always try to put the paint on the lip. I call it the mother load. Then I swiggle, splash, spritz a little water, bring down from the mother load. By the way, the way I clean my brush, I don't know how you do yours, I bang it on the bottom of the water, and then 
I use my very special tool. This looks like a sponge, but it's your water corrector, my water corrector. So I do that, and then I'm just going to take that medium CAD, and like I said, you never know what you're going to get. So I was trying this before and got this color, which I kind of like. I think that's very flamingo-ish. If I wanted a light pink, I would use that. I think that's a little too light. That might be a little too dark. But as you know, if you've worked with watercolors, watercolors dry light. They dry 50% lighter. So if you love this color, make it darker because you won't get it otherwise. I don't usually paint upside down looking upside down, but I'm going to today because I want you to be able to see. A lot of times um, my students want to paint like that. Go fast. Be brave. You can use the side of the brush. See how it's not touching there? Oh, I don't want to dip my paint in, I mean, my brush into the wax. Okay, so I'm going to try to get this painted quickly. I could have used a little more white on that neck, but let's see what happens with this. Okay, so where I painted wax, I'm not getting any paint. It's staying white. Just what we want. Using my water corrector, and I'm staying, I'm staying not too close to those black lines because you might get upset if it bled into what's going to be your background. Not to, not that you need to get upset because everything can be corrected, but. You can actually go quite quickly with this because you've already... It's kind of the opposite. It's the opposite thought process that you use when you're ordinarily doing watercolor. You might, with watercolor, and I have a zillion times, done my background first. Played wet on wet, wet on dry, dry on dry, dry on wet. So you're thinking in reverse here. And while some of it may not make sense quite yet, it's going to make a lot of sense and be very entertaining. The, the, one of the things, one of the reasons I love Batik so much is that there are always surprises. Um, you're working, you're working hard, but it's like you're in partnership with surprise, with God, with chance, however you want to look at it. So we're almost done with the flamingos. And the reason I'm trying to do this fast is because I want you to see what happens after... The, remember I said there were three steps? Does anybody remember what they are? They are save, i.e. wax, paint, and then comes dry. So the thing we're going to do after we get this painted to our satisfaction is take it outside, hang it up on a clothesline, and let it dry. One thing I'm going to do is get some of the leaves done now. So I'm going to, this is what I do, I add water, bring down the paint from the mother load, you always want to do, if I haven't said this before, I don't think I have, brightest first. Bright, light. Because what you're going to do after it dries, you're going to bring it back in and save what you love. What do I mean by save? I mean wax. This is the process of layering that makes a batik a batik. Bright, save, then you add your darker layers, then you make it look multi-dimensional. So why am I doing yellow on leaves? Aren't leaves usually mostly green? 
when I put blue over it or green over it, it'll get green. But I'll be able to save some of these beautiful yellows that will give a really luminous quality to my painting, to your painting. And I don't have to do it on all of them, and I don't have to do a lot. I might even want to use a different kind of yellow. These are all warm yellows. Maybe, oops, remember, I have to add water. If you painted with this, with this lump of sticky paint pigment, it would never dry. And worse, it wouldn't let the light through. You want translucency. So I'm going to just put a little of this bright yellow. Ooh, that's going to be nice. I can see what that's going to do mixed with green later. That's going to be quite lovely. Oops. Not quite enough water. Use my water corrector. Okay, we're going to take a little break now just to... I mean, you're not going to take a little break, but I am going to go outside. I have a clothesline hanging. Just your ordinary clothesline hanging between your not-so-ordinary two palm trees. Going to hang it up, let it dry. And are you asking the question, what do you do while it's drying? Good question. What you do is start another painting. This is why when people come to my class, they're here for three to four hours. And at the end of that three to four hours, they have two complete, ready-to-frame paintings. So, see you when this gets a dry. Now, our flamingos are hanging up to dry, and I have some paint left over on the board. I'm going to do another, start working on something else. So I want to make sure I don't have any wet paint on here, because I don't want it to go on anything else. Now, if we were in a class, or at home, I would have you take another sheet of blank paper, tape it up, do your picture, get it to the point where you want to do your wax, your whites, and you would start painting that. You would put in your beautiful artist's signature. Well, let's pretend that I've already done that. So let's say, this is not my favorite painting, and it's probably why I never finished it. But, here it is. I've painted, I've saved. If we had longer time and I was doing it like I would do a regular painting, I would save again. I would save those beautiful orangey yellows. And then I might add some sienna. I might add some Van Dyke, which would make it look more multi-dimensional. But I'm going to pretend that I'm happy with this. And I don't want to do anything else to it, but get ready for the background. Because I want you to get to the point where you see what really makes a batik a batik. Okay, so what do I have to do now? I'm happy with my painting. What I have to do is totally wax it. I have to wax everything that I have paint on. So it's a bit of a challenge because it dries fast. So you can't just go on and on and on. You have to be able to do it quickly. And you're always lifting. And because you have your beautiful artist signature at the bottom here, you know this is the right side. And you're not going to be in trouble later. As if I haven't been in trouble sometimes. You know, even if you do make quote-unquote mistakes. I'm not going to call them mistakes. Let's say you paint on the thready side. Well, it's just going to be different. 
It's not a horrible thing. It's just going to be a different kind of resistance. And you can see that I'm not painting. Oh, look. What do you do when you get wax where you don't want it? You are going to get wax occasionally in places where you don't want it. It doesn't matter. This One of the things I love most about Batik is that it's a very forgiving medium. And part of that is because of what happens at the end, which I'm not going to tell you yet. I will just say, we've done the beginning. Now we're doing the middle. The third last and second last steps at the end is where you hate me before you love me. Oh no, have I almost forgotten to lift? I've made all these mistakes. Now you can see why it's important to do it. If I had waited much longer, I would have had a problem. But even that can be corrected because you just go over it with more hot wax. So everything, everything is fixable. And I'm still waiting for my flamingos to dry, but I am being very productive because the next thing I'm going to do is whip up a batch of paint for my background. So am I going to be realistic? Am I going to be fantasy? You don't have to wait, by the way, between waxing and painting. You only have to wait between painting and coming back in. You have to dry before you do the next saving. So that's why it's good to work on two pieces at once. I'm thinking I will do some browns at the bottom, making a little foreground showing that they're rooted in something. Some greens, some blues, and you want your background colors to be juicy. You want it to be juicy and you want to use a big brush. I could do a number of things. I could, I could have Let's pretend they're in a forest, but there's a streak of sunlight coming through. So we'll mix up a little sunlight. Um, it's nice to have a lot of different flavors. So I have the warm, I have the cool. Oh, you know what else I'm going to do? I think we need some splatters on this to make the background interesting. Okay, so I shake off some of the wax so that I don't get big blobs. And here I go. Can you see it? Maybe you can't see it now, but you will when I paint the background. And maybe a few. I love, I love fan brushes. Do you love fan brushes? You can't exactly predict what you're going to get, but it's going to be interesting. Ooh, those are nice. Ooh, that's nice too. All right. Okay, so we are going to get this juicy streak of sunlight. You want to go straight through. Because you've waxed it, you don't have to worry about it. I hope I was sufficiently careful. We'll find out. All right. And we want to change up the flavor a little bit. I think I'll add a little, make it a little warmer. I don't know if I want, I want some of those streaks. I like them. Okay, let's wash that out. I don't really want those little bubbles, little bubbles on the wax, so I am going to take them off. But you see, I didn't destroy any of my painting and the mushrooms. Okay, now I'm going to uh, mix up some juicy blues. 
I have a lot of variety here. Okay. Oh, we have phthalo. We have ultramarine. So many wonderful colors. And we'll probably get some green where it all meets. Can you see how the bubbles are? Oh, I like the green where it meets. See, there's no other way you could get these kind of effects. That's one of the things I love about Batik. Happy surprises. And maybe we want a little more blue of um, green in with the yellow. I'm not following my own rule about bringing it down. There we go. So let's see what that's like. A little bit of that here. I'm not being very careful. But that's what brings you uh, interesting, free, painterly effects. Um, one thing that I always tell my students because I have found it to be both true and valuable, is make your corners dark. Remember, well, as you well know, uh, watercolor dries light. So, let's just finish this up quickly. I want you to at least see all the steps. Remember, we're not trying to make a masterpiece today. We're learning the steps to the ancient art of batik painting. There's an infinite number of things you can do. You can see how this technique would look beautiful when you're painting orchids, because you can make these little dots and save layers and layers of color. I have some paintings where I've done six, eight, ten different layers of saving, and I'm always happy that I've done it. Now, we know this is going to dry light, and um, we're not going to take the time to make it darker. But what we're going to do now, let me tell you, when you go to hang, I probably have 120 hints I can give you on how to solve potential problems, how to get various effects, but today you're getting a taste. And you're getting a taste in the studio where I teach. It's a beautiful place. It's called uh, Our Place in Paradise. And it really feels like paradise, I've been telling you. See, and the darker I make it, the nicer these little bright whites look. Okay, I think I'll stop now. It'll be, it'll be quite pale, but the nice thing about it is how it will look. Ooh, that's nice. How it will look when when we do that final step. Well, I haven't seen it right side up, but I'm pretty happy. I think I'd like a little more purple. But my students tell me that I'd always like a little more purple. I can't help it. Okay, that's it. We're going to take this one outside and bring in those flamingos. I have taken the flamingos off the line. It's dry. I'm pretty happy with it. And now, even though if I were doing this by myself, I might want to do the stages two or three times, wax, paint, dry, I'm going to do it one more time because I want you to see it and because I want you to see all of the steps. I don't want to have to leave any out. So here we go. What do I want to save? I love this part here. I want to save a little bit of the legs. Again, I shake it before I put it on the paper. I have, by the way, cleaned my board, which was very messy with all kinds of wet paint. I want to save a little bit of that, but I want that to be darker, so I'm going to hardly save at anything at all. 
I'm going to save some of this light because I want to make the neck darker. I'm going to save a little bit of this light cheek, but I want to make the head darker. I'm going to save some of that lightness, but I want to save some of these beautiful colors. Not all of it, but a few little spots because I'm going to be going over it with greens and yellows and blues. All in preparation for having... All of this is the foreground. And I must remember to lift it so it doesn't rip. I think that is probably enough. And now I'm going to mix up some colors for the... Um, no, I'm not. Now I'm going to just do my colors to finish painting the leaves and the flamingos. I've squeezed some extra cadmium red because I need it. And I think I have enough alizarin crimson still. Um, so what I'm going to do now is my second series. We've done our save, paint, dry. We've done our save. So now I'm going to paint, I'm going to put it out to dry, and then we'll do what we need to do to bring it to the grand finale. Okay. I have also changed my water. A good thing to do regularly. So I want to do that same step, bring down from the mother load. I want to make it darker. And this is where you'll see what you've done by saving. I can just paint because I know it'll take where I want it to, and it won't take where I haven't waxed. So let's see what happens. Yeah, so can you see that it's saving lights and darks? I may do some of this on my own in the interest of saving time so that you can see. I love it. So you can see what happens in the last part because it's very unique and interesting. See how nice it is when you get to save that those beautiful yellows? So I'm going to finish this part on my own, away from you. Then I will hang this out to dry, and when I come back, we'll do what we need to do to get it ready for the actual batiking part. Okay, I have finished the leaves, and whatever else I want to do so that you can see a little more dimensionality. You can see how the batik is working. Now they are going outside to dry. When they come back, it'll be background time. When we last saw this mushroom painting, it just had wax on the foreground and we did a background, put it out to dry. Now I want to show you step next, which is basically waxing the whole piece. Now there's a very intricate technique to this. I call it fast and sloppy. Okay, because you want to get enough wax on, but you don't want to have to do it twice. So what I do is I make sure that the brush has a lot of wax and I don't shake off the brush. And after I do a stripe of wax, I pick it up so it's not. All right, so here we go. Stripe two. This time I'm going to take the risk of doing two swipes of wax and then, okay. It's still pretty wet. It's supposed to be pretty wet. It's only wet with wax. You just heard the voice of my friend who is filming this, my filmographer. Okay, we're almost done. See how fast this goes? It's going to make your work board very sloppy, but at this point it's okay because when we're all done, we're just going to take that refreezer paper off and we are going to throw it away and use it next time with fresh paper. Okay. Now, you may or may not believe where this is going next. But, it's going into the freezer. 
when you last saw the flamingos, I had just been about to do the second painting. We had waxed and saved. I did the painting, I did the leaves, I did the saving, and it's been out there drying. I brought it back in. I did that same step that I did with the mushroom painting, and I waxed everything that I had paint on. Once I waxed everything that I had paint on, I did a background, it was soaking wet, and I took it outside to dry, and now, voila, it's dry, and I can do what I did to the mushroom painting. Fast and sloppy, get it ready for the freezer. This is the, um, this is kind of the fun part. The next part is the part where you'll hate me. I'll leave it in the freezer for at least five minutes. The point is that we want the wax to be hard. We want it so that when I take the painting and crumple it over a garbage can so that wax doesn't fall on your floor, it will create what we're going for is creating beautiful diagonals into which our next coat of paint will flow and go and create those batik lines that we all know and love. After which we will iron and take all the wax off and be ready for the big reveal. Theoretically you could stop right here but now comes the exciting, unexpected part. It's been waxed, it's been painted, it's been dried, it's been waxed again, and now the whole thing is waxed, and it's spent several minutes, hopefully at least five, in the refrigerator known as the freezer, that part. Okay, I like to do this corner to corner, corner to corner, and firmly but gently crumple it. Oh my god, I worked so hard on my beautiful painting. What is my teacher doing? She's setting you up for success, not failure. Though I have to admit, one time when I did it, it did end in failure because I shook off the wax, the extra wax. Don't do that. Just kind of Open it up gently, and you'll see that instead of wax here, I now have newspaper. So this is the part where it becomes batiki. I like to use for this final part um, Dick Blick liquid watercolors. They are very intense. They come in quite a few colors. And uh, you need to add water to them because, because they are so intense. So, choosing colors. I have to confess, I really like the blue-violet. I'm going to use a little bit of the blue-green up here. If I were doing this, I would be using yellow, blue-green, violet, orange, and we just don't have time today. But. This will give you an idea of how it's going to go. So, I'm going to do the bottom first. I add a little water to this intense color. And because this is all about checking in, I'm going to... Ooh, that's a little intense. But what the hell? We like it intense. All right, here we go. Now. You don't want to be painting. You're just, you're just dancing it across. Don't do that. Okay, so you're dancing it across. You're not overdoing it. I might need a little more water. And our hope is, you see all those little crinkles? Our hope is that when we iron out the wax, it will force the paint 
into the cracks. And we will get that lovely, unimaginable, unplanned effect. Um, now I'm going to use the blue-green up top. So you definitely want a different brush. Ooh, it's almost turquoisey. And I used to only use one color for painting. But my students have taught me to be brave. They go, oh, no, let's use four or five. All right, we can do that. Okay, we're almost ready for the last step. Um, I need to plug in the iron. And then we will be ready. I think we'll even do a little bit on the flamingos. What the heck? Now, if you get big blobs, then you want to take a piece of paper towel, which I don't have, so we'll just pretend it's okay. And it will be okay. Okay. We're almost ready for the big reveal. You want to have a bed of paper that's very thick. You want at least two underneath and one on top. Now I'm going to stop for a second and get my iron. The painting is now under the newspaper. Pretend you're ironing a shirt. Go slow because you want the wax to melt and you want it to melt thoroughly. The only time I've ever had a problem was when my iron wasn't hot enough and the newsprint came off on the painting. That was not a particularly happy accident, although the wording was interesting because it kind of went with the painting. Okay, so you can see I've gone all the way to the borders. I'm not going to show you what it looks like yet. I tell people to close their eyes. We're going to do this process two more times. We've done it. I've ironed it three times with one sheet above, two sheets below. Don't look. Actually, why not? This is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like. Look what white does to it. I have it with my signature showing, so it's on the right way. We've done it. You've done all the steps with me. I will do it again in a little bit for the mushroom painting. I have a few others to do, but basically you have seen every step. I hope you've enjoyed it. Here are a few of my favorite student batiks, some of them done by absolute beginners, some by well-established artists. They all went home happy with new learnings and with two complete paintings. There will be classes at our place in Paradise in Isla Morada on the 13th of January, which is a Wednesday, and the 23rd of January, I've given your people my address and email. And uh, feel free to call our place in paradise if you want to come and take the class with me. You'll go home with two paintings. And in the works is an online class. Right now we're going to have questions and answers. So I am so interested in your thoughts and the questions. Thanks a lot for inviting me to do this. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope I get to meet some of you. Bye.